Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani. The topic for this lesson and the next is aerobic cellular respiration. Now I've divided up this topic into two parts in order to go over the big picture and some of the background information on this first lesson so we can then focus on the details of cellular respiration on the next. So let's take a look at the overall equation for aerobic cellular respiration. First, it is called aerobic because this process requires air in the form of oxygen gas to transfer the energy in food into many molecules called ATP. ATP is the only energy currency the cell will accept for doing work. In the process, carbon dioxide gas and water are produced. The carbon dioxide gas is exhaled as a waste product, and the water stays to be used by cells. Oh, and another thing, this reaction is not the most efficient. There is a lot of energy found in glucose that is not harvested into molecules of ATP and is released as heat. So before we start looking at the details of cellular respiration, let's try to understand ATP real quick. So ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is a nucleic acid. It is made of a ribose sugar that has a nitrogenous base called adenine attached to it at one end and a trio of phosphate groups attached at the other end. And that's where the tri of the triphosphate name comes from. The thing you need to know about these three phosphate groups is that they hate being bonded to each other because they can't stand being this close together. So whenever the cell manages to break a bond between the phosphate groups and ATP, energy is released. So ATP supplies the energy for cellular functions. Essentially, when the cell needs energy for anything at all, um, active transport, moving a muscle, a chemical reaction, it can only get the energy from molecules of ATP. Well, mostly. There are exceptions, some of which we will learn about later in this course, where a slightly different molecule other than ATP is used. But why can't the cell get its energy directly from food, you might ask? Well, there are many reasons. One is simply that cellular processes have evolved chemically to be able to use ATP as a source of energy. But also, glucose just has way too much energy for a single chemical reaction or a single process in the cell. Think of it like having a $100 bill, but you can only use the money on a vending machine that takes loonies. So, well, you can go to the bank and you can ask for loonies. And you can then use those loonies to make many trips to the vending machine. Although, in this analogy, instead of giving you 100 loonies for your $100 bill, the bank only gives you like 38 or a few less than that. The rest is lost as heat, I guess? I don't know. This is where my analogy falls apart a little bit. So getting back to ATP. The way that ATP works as an energy molecule is by a hydrolysis reaction. That means that water is added as the bond between the second and third phosphate group breaks, converting ATP, which has three phosphate groups, into ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, with two phosphate groups, and releasing energy in the process. A common analogy people use compares ATP to a reusable battery. So when the cell needs energy, it breaks the bond between the second and third phosphate group, and energy is released, leaving an empty battery of ADP and a free inorganic phosphate group. The energy release can then be used by the cell for whatever it needs energy for, but that ADP can be recharged by adding a phosphate group and energy from food. And the chemical reaction that does this is cellular respiration. One thing to keep in mind is that having that extra phosphate group raises the energy of a molecule. That extra phosphate group charges the battery. ATP has more energy than ADP because it has an extra phosphate group. The process of transferring a phosphate group from one molecule to another is called phosphorylation, and it always increases the energy of a molecule. During cellular respiration, energy from our food is used to phosphorylate ADP back into ATP. This increases the energy of ATP by taking energy from, say, glucose. Then ATP will lose its phosphate group and lose that energy whenever the cell needs to use energy to perform the many functions that require energy in the cell, like active transport or muscle contractions. Okay, 
So let's go back to aerobic cellular respiration and learn how the energy in a single glucose molecule can be stored in about 38 molecules of ATP. Now I want to note here that this number of ATP is kind of a best case scenario of optimal ATP yield. Cells will rarely manage to produce 38 ATP from a single glucose molecule for a variety of reasons. Now if you're interested in what some of these reasons are, you can read about them on the lesson notes I provided. Also, let's remember that the process of cellular respiration also results in a lot of energy being lost as heat, which is actually a good thing for us because this heat is lost from every energy transfer and is what keeps us warm. Now the chemical reaction of cellular respiration doesn't happen in one step. It actually involves over 20 different chemical reactions and is divided into four stages. At this point, you might want to pull out the lesson worksheet I provided. Uh, it might make it easier to follow along with the lesson and to organize your notes. If you lost your worksheet, don't worry, a new one can be printed if you click on the link provided on D2L. But don't start yet. Wait for the next slide and we will complete the worksheet step by step. Okay, so let's start with the first stage called glycolysis. During glycolysis, one molecule of glucose gets split into two molecules called pyruvate. As a matter of fact, the term glycolysis means the splitting or lysis of glucose. And this doesn't happen right away. There are 10 separate reactions involved in glycolysis. Glycolysis reactions occur in a cytosol, and so not in the mitochondria of the cell. During the splitting of glucose in glycolysis, two electron carriers, these molecules called NAD+, will pick up high energy electrons from the sugar, becoming NADH. And I know this is new information, and I will explain this in a little bit more detail later. Also during glycolysis, two molecules of ATP are produced that can now be used by the cell for energy. The process that produces those two molecules of ATP during glycolysis is called substrate level phosphorylation because it uses enzymes in order to transfer phosphate groups from the substrate, in this case, the sugar, into ADP. So let's move on to the next stage of cellular respiration, and this stage is called pyruvate oxidation. Now during this stage, the two pyruvate molecules from glycolysis will enter the mitochondria, where the molecule will once again lose high energy electrons that are picked up by NAD+. So let's talk about that now. Okay, so about those high energy electrons. The reason glucose and fats are a good source of energy or fuel for our cells is because of the electrons that are shared between carbon and hydrogen atoms. The electron pairs shared in the carbon to hydrogen bonds are shared pretty much equally, as opposed to say the electrons shared between oxygen and hydrogen and water. Remember when we were discussing electronegativity values at the start of the term, right? We established that some atoms, like oxygen, are really attracted to electrons. Well, when electrons move closer to a more electronegative atom, they lose energy. So when the electrons in the carbon to hydrogen bonds in glucose are moved to form a molecule like water, the electrons lose energy and the energy is released to make ATP. Now, how exactly that energy is transferred from the electrons into ATP is something that we will discuss in the next lesson. Now, in this cell, there are these molecules that act like taxis, or um, Uber drivers, I guess, whose job it is to pick up higher energy electrons from the carbon to hydrogen bonds in glucose and to transport them to molecules of oxygen. The carrier molecule can then be recycled and reused to pick up more electrons. And by the way, carrier molecules, of which this one, NAD+, is just one example, are usually called energy carriers, but are also called electron carriers or proton carriers because they also pick up protons or H plus ions when picking up electrons. Now, by moving from the bonds in glucose, to the highly electronegative bonds in oxygen, the electrons lose energy, which is used to make ATP. When a molecule, for example glucose in this case, loses electrons to another molecule, we say that the molecule is being oxidized, and we call this process oxidation. The process of gaining electrons is called reduction. 
So of course, oxidation cannot happen without reduction because if a molecule loses electrons, another molecule is gaining them. We call these reactions redox reactions for reduction oxidation. And there are many cute mnemonic devices you can use in order to remember which part of the process is oxidation and which part is reduction. So when I was in school, I was taught this one. Leo the lion says grr for loss of electrons oxidation and gain of electrons reduction. There's also oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, or Elmo for electron loss means oxidation. Anyways, use whichever one you feel is going to be more memorable to you. The key is to remember that during oxidation, a molecule or an atom loses electrons, and during reduction, another molecule or atom is gaining the electrons. So let's get back to pyruvate oxidation. Hey, why is it called oxidation? Well, the pyruvate molecules are losing high energy electrons that are picked up by the electron carrier, NAD+. So now the products of that process are two molecules called acetyl-CoA and two molecules of carbon dioxide gas. So we started with a molecule of glucose. How many carbons did glucose have? Six, right? So then that glucose was split into two molecules of pyruvate. Guess how many carbons each pyruvate molecule has? Well, six divided by two, so three carbons. Now each pyruvate molecule lost a carbon dioxide gas during pyruvate oxidation. So how many carbons do you think acetyl-CoA has? If you thought two, you are correct. Each acetyl-CoA molecule is made up of only two carbons, for a total of four carbons from the original glucose molecule. The other two carbons have now been lost in carbon dioxide gas. Now let's move on to the third stage of cellular respiration. The citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle after the scientists who discovered the process. This process also occurs in the mitochondria, in the liquid interior of the mitochondria called the matrix, which is also where pyruvate oxidation happens. The citric acid cycle is a series of eight reactions that start and ends with the same molecule, hence why it's a cycle. At the end of this process, electrons will once again be carried away by electron carriers, our trusty NAD+, but also a second carrier, FAD. Also, two more ATP are produced by substrate-level phosphorylation, and four more carbon dioxide gas will be released. So let's take stock here. We started with a molecule of glucose, which we agreed has six carbons. How many carbons do you think are left now of the original glucose? Well, none. At this point, the sugar molecule is all gone. The carbons and the oxygens are gone in the carbon dioxide gas, and the hydrogens left with the electrons of the electron carriers. But wait a minute. The sugar is gone, and we've only produced 4 ATP. What happened? We were promised 38 ATP molecules for every glucose molecule. It's okay. The process is not done, because the glucose molecule may be gone, but its high-energy electrons are still around. They're being carried by the electron carriers, NADH and FADH2, into the next step, which is the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. The electron transport chain also occurs in the mitochondria. But unlike the citric acid cycle and pyruvate oxidation, which happen in the matrix or the fluid inside the mitochondria, the electron transport chain actually occurs in the membrane of the mitochondria, actually in between the two membranes of the mitochondria. So here, a series of steps will take place that will use the energy from the electrons that are carried by NADH and FADH2 in order to produce 34 ATP by a process called oxidative phosphorylation. During this process, six oxygen molecules are used, 
and water molecules are produced. So there you have it. Cellular mm -hmm. respiration from beginning to end. All reactants and products are now accounted for. Of course, I've left a lot out of this explanation because this was just a general overview of the process. The details are still to come in the next video. You may want to read over your lesson notes or watch some of the other videos that I've linked on D2L just to become a little bit more familiar with the details of cellular respiration before the next lesson video. It's up to you. Either way, I will talk to you soon. Bye, guys.